So I said, my name is Robert Shadid, and I work for the European Commission for the Joint Research Center. Um, I think I fit on the, uh, what Corinne uh, mentioned this uh, morning on the uh, software developing scientists. So, uh, or what Scott uh, said, the course of activity in nightmares, because they write uh, crappy code and try to make it work. So that's pretty much my background. Um, I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this uh, uh, initiative that we have. It's called the Bioethics and Technology. And then I'll move into uh, the MSC that we developed and the uh, modular approach we took to the design of the MSC. Um, at that point, I'll, I'll try to focus more on how that can contribute to discussion in the afternoon, in particular after the presentation this morning. So, um, some back in 2003 in, in, in Europe. Uh, there was, we call it a, a, a regulation, I think, that uh, mainly what that regulation said is uh, all the member states have to collect data on fisheries. And to collect that data, the European Commission uh, provided its funds, which at that point meant that um, the, the, the budget that was available to collect data basically doubled in some kind, in some cases, tripled. Um, with relation to the value of the fishery, we are talking about a little bit about one percent. But if we think about the impact he said on the on the on the national institutes, it was huge. And uh, the numbers we have, the rough estimate, is that we are spending more or less 75 million euros a year collecting. Um, when we looked into that a couple of years later, when we started this initiative, the so-called assessment initiative. What we noticed was that, in fact, although we, were, uh, we had increased so much the, the, the budget for collecting the data, the stocks, the number of stocks that were being uh, assessed by ISIS with analytical models didn't really increase that much. They were kind of the same. And the advice that was being given was also more or less on, on the same number of stocks. So there was a list of numbers. There must be something here that is not working because we, we put so much money on this. Why, is it, uh, why don't we have more uh, stock assessments? Uh, uh, why are we still stuck with the same number of stock assessments? Well, there's several reasons for that, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter for now. What matters was that was the basis that was uh, what we had in our background when we decided to move on with this uh, paper initiative. And what we wanted to, the way we, we looked into it at that point, this is what I'll more or less, was, well, we, we have an issue with stock assessment models. Maybe we need a stock assessment model that would make it simpler, doesn't require so much data, and uh, that could uh, provide the tools to do more assessments. On the other hand, um, we look into the, the advice, how people are giving advice, and uh, ISIS was still giving advice on a very short time scale, as, as it still does anyway. But we thought, well, maybe what we should do is actually put also a, a strong effort on developing some MSC tools that, allow, that would allow people to you know, run these things faster, having a, a, a more opportunities to, to have a, a more long term perspective on the stocks instead of going through this yearly turn the grand process where we are. And, uh, and finally, we said, okay, we need to, so we need to train people, people to use this tool. Um, I have to say that sitting now in 2019, uh, well, there's a mix of, of uh, success in, in this process. Uh, the NSC part took off, and I'll show you a couple of examples. The stock assessment part, uh, it's, it's developed and exists, and it's, uh, in my opinion, it's a very good model. But um, in the ICV, it didn't really took off. It took off, uh, it's more used in the trial for some of the stocks that were assessed. The GFCM, which is the, uh, it's the fisheries management organization. So, what is a model or MSC and how can it help? Um, I was listening to the, the three uh, presentations we had today, and uh, my, my perception at least is that at this point, arguing that the is a good thing, this software, 
discussion. Uh, I guess we all will we all agree that having modular approaches to software development is a good thing, and there's a lot of advantages that have to bring the table. So where can we actually fit in? And my my thinking is at, at some point during this morning there was a discussion about is it scalable? Can we have modules and then scale these modules? Can we have new things? And for some reason, we didn't really sort about them. And uh, what where I think our experience can bring some interesting discussions here is not so much about if you need modules, but about which modules do you need? And how can we actually design those modules? How can you think about the modules in a way that later on you're not getting stuck with something that you didn't review? Of course, this is all wishful thinking because uh, forecasting the future is, 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 is difficult. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, well, the, this is the experience we have with this particular MSC. So let me start on, on the. This may be this may be very Europe centric, but anyway, um, we started from this idea: what is the management cycle? And at this point, basically, our management cycle. Um, the management cycle that we have right now fits more or less in this, this flow. We have, we have well, let's start here. We have a resource that is being caught by an industry, right? We have science here which collects information on these processes that the industry has about the industry and the resource, gives some advice to the government or some government. And this government body tries to regulate that industry. And we, we keep on doing this in, in Europe. We keep doing this year after year. We collect information, provide that information, run our stock assessments, give advice to some government body, and these guys go and try to regulate the fishery. The fishery, keep, the fishery keep going, the stocks keep going, and so on. So if you think about an MSC, the MSC in this case, and this is one version of the MSCs, for uh, uh, the MSC in this case is, is actually uh, uh, trying to mimic that process. From one side, we have a management procedure, and the management procedure, what it tries to do is to encapsulate that part of the science advice and the governance that is, uh, and decisions that are made by governments, by government bodies to regulate the fishery. On the other side, we have the operating model, which is basically trying to replicate how that fishery works. And now that uh, those stocks, those resources do react to pressure of that fishery and environment and everything else. So uh, the, the, the MSC design, as we have it, fits onto that initial governance cycle, management cycle. The links between these two, uh, these two groups are done through the observation error model, which is here, and through the implementation error model. So from one side, we take information from into the management procedure using the observation, and then the feedback into the operating model through the decisions and the implementation of those decisions. There's a bunch of alternatives to this. Thing. So some some authors use the, include the observation error inside the management procedure. So mainly what you're saying is already part of the decision that you make to manage the stock. Some authors include the implementation error inside the operating model, for example. So the, the implementation error is part of what's happening in, in the observation, in the, in the operation model. Um, but in any case, this is uh, a concept, a conceptualization of that management cycle. So what did we do from here? We looked into these processes and we say, okay, we have all these processes. How can we modularize these processes? How can we build a bunch of smaller processes, and some uh, we, we had uh, several mention, several references to these now. We call it sub models or uh, arts or whatever. So how can we pick that and turn it into a bunch of small processes that then we can look into each one of them and encapsulate each one of them on its own coding, which will allow me then to extend whatever direction I want. Right. So what we did was. The operating model that starts here, so that was uh, divided between fleet dynamics and population dynamics. It's kind of a simple part of it, of course, simple to say, not simple to do, but anyway. 
Then we, we put it on an observation error here. So we have an observation error model that brings whatever it's on the operating model into our management procedure. And then in our management procedure, we have this process here. We have first an estimator. So we receive that information from the operating model and we estimate something that's going to be used later on to parameterize the Argus control rule. Then we have the Argus control rule that will decide based on whatever comes up this direction. And this Argus control rule then is turned, whatever is coming out of the Argus control rule is turned into something that is implemented, that is actually something that we can regulate. Uh, yeah. well, no, we cannot regulate fishing mortality. We cannot say, you're going to fish at 0 0.2 next year. That doesn't work. So we have to translate whatever comes out of that harvest control rule into something that is regulated. So this is, notice that by doing this, we separated a couple of things that usually are. One is that our parameterization of the harvest control rule is not part of the estimator and it's not part of the so which means that the, the and this is something that in ICE is happens quite often which is we pick up some reference points from our stock assessment and we use those reference points directly with the and those become those become parameters of the there's some advantages of doing that but there's also disadvantages so what we decided well let's separate these things so in fact if in the future for some reason, we actually want to break down these in different parts, then we can do it. We have to do it. The same thing between these other control rules and the participation. It's also, uh, um, it's not it's common, let's say, that your office control rule or the way we code the office control rule will give us immediately whatever we want to implement on the, on the stock, right? So we thought, no, we should separate these things. Because we can give a lot more freedom to our harvest control rule. If the harvest control rule come up with something that is an objective, a concept that we want to achieve, and then we have another process that actually translates that concept into something that we are going to implement, that we are going to enforce in the future. Okay? So, um, without trying to stop my presentation now, this is uh, the way, uh, at least I saw the, 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 the presentations today, and what are the objectives of this workshop? I think this was, this is the most interesting or the best or the most important contribution I can bring into the discussion. Is this process of actually spending time on what you want to, to transform or to conceptualize based on the processes you are trying to model. So that at some point in the future, you don't get stuck and say, oh God, I forgot to separate the parameterization of the other control. So then we, we transform this, and this is more the software part, which uh, considering all the bright presentations we had this morning, I'm not sure it's gonna help a lot, but what we did then was when we, we broke it down into uh, IO system, so we know what, for each of these modules, you know what's coming, and you, you know, or it's, it's, it's already defined what you need to put out. So our estimator gets in an FL stock, and now I'm talking about FLR objects, so, doesn't matter, gets in an object with a certain data structure, and it has to put out another object, in this case also an FL stock, and some uh, indices that have to come out already with a structure predefined or something. And it goes on the same way all around this, this, uh, this uh, MSC. So, uh, as I, in, in the morning, I said that I'm coding in R, uh, and, and that's, I'm coding in R, I'm not coding in C++. Um, uh, as, a, as a software developing scientist, uh, at some point you have to draw a line. I draw a line there, I work in R. Um, and um, so what we did was we, we make use of the object-oriented programming features that are, which they are not really, and, and the software professionals around here, they know they are not the full implementation of OOP, but they have the features that you may need to develop a complex uh, system. So what we have is we have a class basically, and this class has, um, what this class does is that it takes a function in a bunch of arguments, and that function, that, that bunch of arguments are what, are what gonna operate on each of these modules. 
and the only uh, uh, rules you have is the, in, the, the input and the output you need. So, for example, in the estimator, you could write down an estimator that is using SS3 or SUM or any other thing. It doesn't matter. What it matters is that you need to be in agreement with the input output system. Okay? And then what our what our class does is you have to write down a function, pass a couple of arguments. This function receives those objects on the loop, does whatever it needs to do, and brings back the, the right objects to move on to the next level. So everything is pretty much based on this, and uh, since this is a software thing, so a, a little bit of code. I hope I didn't break like half of the rules that were uh, described today. But in any case, just to say that this is an Argos control rule, and what this Argos control rule does is uh, mainly gives you a fixed uh, level of condition uh, you want to use. Okay. Just to say that kind of simple way. I'm not going to stop here. Just to um, show you how, for example, in our system, you could set up a, a data pool or a data pool for each function that you see. And, and you see the, the, the difference is here because one thing is the idea that the models should all be independent, which is kind of true from the software perspective, but from the conceptual perspective, that is not true anymore. Because what you need for an estimator based on a top of your system is not the same that you need for an estimator based on a full analytical model. So, although the models from the software design perspective they are independent, from the conceptual part, from the, the scientific part, they are not independent. So, this is how we could uh, set up the tool. So, here, for example, the observation model is in a full feedback model, you need to have catch and catch, you need to have indices. But for example, a data limited model, you might just need to catch many frequencies. And from there, you compute like your estimate of what it's doing in that case is simply computing the average length of the catch. While on a full feedback model, you have a full scope. Okay. Uh, so I'm running out of time, but you can see that in the end of the day, what matters is that these models, the way they are designed, they allow you to develop and to implement very different parts of MSCs and very different parts of analysis. Um, they are independent, but they are not fully independent in the sense that to work down this, it's different. What you need for each of these models is going to be different from to working down this. These are just examples here. So this is the North Sea uh, Lemersol's MSC that was this year that use this, uh, this uh, system. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the Adriatic Sea aerosols of the Central Mediterranean. We also use this system here. In both cases, these are full feedback uh, models with stock assessments and all of that. These are uh, two examples where we use data pool approaches. Uh, this is a, a working group that, you, that exists in ISIS called WK Life, and they explore. Uh, Data limited approaches to, to management. And, uh, last year, the, some of the, uh, the analysis was done using this, uh, this uh, process or this code. And here it's a paper by uh, Jessica Walsh, I think it was published like two years ago. And uh, this paper used also the same system. So I'm not going to stop here because you see we have already a lot of. Discussion about how important it is. I, I think here it's the this last sentence is the sentence that has driven in a lot of our. We think we need to have systems, whatever system we design, whatever we can work with, we have to have more time dedicated to understand the system and to try to, to model the system, not code the system. And to do that, we need to have tools that allow us to do the coding quickly. Or to do the code in a swift way so we don't need to spend, which is kind of common, I suppose, for all of us working on working groups, assessment working groups, which is you spend 90% of your time trying to run the goddamn model. And then the next 10% writing the report and spitting out a bunch of tables and plots that you put on that report, and you go home, you drink a bottle of wine, and you forget everything you do next year. So 
what what we what part of our part of our interest here was actually we simply need to get through and, and get into a different stage in that process. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so this is more the technical part of this. Uh, we used we used the uh, object-oriented programming as much as we could. Uh, everything is programmed in R. Um, uh, uh, well, we, we standardized the models. I think we did what most of us do, which is go through developing, applying, testing, uh, so uh, for what something go back. Develop, apply, test. There's another new thing that someone comes to your office and says, Oh, can I do blue plots? Oh, God, all the plots are orange. Go back, do everything again, prepare blue plots. So that's, that's kind of the usual thing, I guess. We are very good at documenting. Uh, uh, we use Roxygen and all of that. But in the end of the day, it's really probably one of the most difficult things that I've experienced in writing code is documenting. I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think this is great to see the right hand side there a lot. Um, several, I mean, uh, I don't know how many times I've seen. People try to draw, generate these schema, uh, and we've always struggled with the left-hand side, which is the operating model. And there's two pieces to that. Uh, what is the operating model? And, and the thing with MSC, the, the failure of MSC is creating two simple operating models. And, and I, I see a lot of that going on here because um, you know we're moving to operating models like Atlantis. Uh, which I suspect will fit the FLR a bit of a struggle. Um, so there's two issues. One is, well, two questions. One, how do you dealt with encouraging people to really explore operating model uncertainty, because that's the difficult part. And what, is there a step, I guess it's inside FLR, where you condition the operating model parameters rather than, how do you set the parameters of the operating model, uh, which is sort of one of the key steps in the whole thing. I don't sort of see that. Um, so, um, I can, uh, I think I can give you one example for the first case. Um, so first of all, the reason I didn't spend a lot of time on the operating model is because it's very complex, as you say, it would take a lot more than the presentation to deal with. Um, I can give you one example, for example, because uh, we have, uh, uh, here, um, someone that actually uh, condition the entire operating model on a gadget model. So, and a multi species model actually. And um, what was a good surprise for me was that these, these guys coming from, from, from IMR in Norway, they actually picked up all of these bits and pieces and they coded the entire multi species MSC. And that was surprising for me because I wasn't expecting you to do that. Of course, they were, they were three people. They were Right people, one of them was a, a computer scientist, the other two were, were scientists, so there was that interaction and they worked together before, so there was that interaction between them that allowed them to actually do all of that work on a week. This was a week. And, and they did all of that on a week. So it was a, a huge surprise for me. Now, on, in FLR, FLR is mainly a framework. So it's a bit like thinking about R. You can do a lot of things with it as long as you know what to do. And FLR is more or less the same. It gives you the structure to do a lot of things, but then you need to know what to do. In the case of the for a stock assessment model, for example, we are developing and we developed already a lot of features directly to condition the operating model. So we are spending a lot of time on generating simulations, simulating from the processes, the observations, all of that stuff, getting the right um, parameter and various, various per, uh, matrix for the parameters, all of that stuff. So you can actually plug into this system. So, and we are trying, and uh, uh, actually we have some vignettes written, how you can introduce all that variability and all of the circuits which are. Um, 
What I can say more about that is that uh, something I'll present later this week is this idea about uh, model ensembles, where we have uh, we are trying to find a way of actually bringing the model uncertainty also into the operating model. Um, so I guess there's a lot out there. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's, that's, that's uh, very good. The uh, FMR will come a long way. Um, one thing hasn't been mentioned yet, because I think everybody assumes it, is when I told this, how much you made it have a lot of open source. It's all there on the GitHub and the various other parts. Um, and I, I would emphasize that that is a really important part of any software development. And I think you guys are doing an excellent job of making it. Thank you. Um, well, I guess from from the beginning, um, this this started two thousand and three, two thousand and four. I think Richard was involved in the first interactions of that. We were all kind of very keen into open source, all of us, and and, and uh, I I am still very much into open source. I think you cannot, in my perspective, if you are giving advice to the exploitation of natural resources that belong to the state, you should not do it except if your software is open. That's my line of song, and my line of singing. So, and then we've done that all the way. So, FLR is naturally open source, is MSC is open source, the A4A is open source, all of that is open source. Not to say that it's cheap, because people need to be aware that being open source is not the same as being, you know, the idea that free software. It's free as yes. free speech, not free free media. There's a difference there. <laughs> since, since we have all the beer today, <laughs> all the week into. So um, you said you, you modularized this, right? And you gave examples of us the MSC and modularized. What about the sub components of everything, like modularizing natural utilities? So that's sort of, I presume it will be done that. Well, again, a lot, a lot. I think a lot of this, um, a lot of this process is you, you build the structure to be done. Now, if you can do it or not depends on two things. One is your ability to write the software. The other is your ability to actually model those dynamics and natural mortality is one of them. We all know the natural mortality is zero point two. So, you know, uh, there's this. The, you have the, you can do that, and, and in, in this process, you can do it through a module that deals with the operating module that deals with the stop dynamics. For that module, you could actually write something that, for example, would change that from mortality and the stock based on the predator stock dynamics or something like that. You can do that. That's, it's it's uh, it's that advantage of having a module is that whatever you do inside the module, as long as you fulfill the contract. Cheese, you receive X and you have to give back Y, you can do whatever you want. So, your, your stock assessment model can be used in the modularization and inside the model? Well, so the stock assessment model is, uh, is a different thing because we have, of course, the, our, the, the A4A stock assessment model is built around the bunch of sub models. And these sub models you deal with them uh, also uh, individually, of course. They are not completely encapsulated because they interact with each other, because again, the they fit the model all together. Um, it's, uh, it has a bunch of models which um, some of them you can use it directly here. So it's an activity, it's a typical one, so recruitment also. But then there's a bunch of other models that you may not be able to turn on that you may not really useful for, uh, for uh, commissioning your operating model. I'm thinking we have a model for the structure of the population on the first year of observation. I suppose that's not very useful for commissioning your operating model. 
Yeah, if there's no questions, so thanks.